Today I want to talk about a concept from computer architecture called pipelining. I will start with explaining what pipelining is, then follow up with explaining why it's important, then provide a few technical and non-technical examples of pipelining, and finish the video by showing off a pipelining simulator I made that you can play around with yourself. If you find my video insightful, interesting or useful and believe that other people should see it too, then please consider subscribing. Alright, with the preamble out of the way, I'd like to quickly motivate the video. As some of you may know from my other videos, I'm a recent University of Alberta graduate. However, living in Alberta for three years of my life is not the reason I like pipelining. The reason is that, in my opinion, it is one of the most fascinating foundational concepts in computer architecture and it deserves far more attention than it gets. Not only that, but understanding pipelining at the architectural level can also be incredibly important for designing and building scalable and highly robust software. I'm clearly getting ahead of myself, so to get back on track, let's quickly discuss what pipelining is. In the context of computer architecture, pipelining is simply a technique of computer organization where you process more information or instructions by running different independent parts of your process in parallel. Whenever you cover this concept in university, you're usually presented with a diagram like this to try and help you understand what is going on. I will do the same now, and I will also use the prototypical example, doing laundry. So let's specialize the diagram to reflect this example. First, the system is going to be called doing laundry. The system input is clearly dirty laundry. The first stage is washing. The output of that stage and the input of the next is wet laundry. The second stage is drying. The output of that stage and the input of the next is dry laundry. The third stage is folding which produces the system output of dry folded laundry. I will color code each stage just to make it easier to understand what is going on in the next part of the video. So washing is red, drying is yellow and folding is gray just like the task itself is. Let's very quickly run through an example of running this system. In this example, we need to do four loads of laundry and each stage in the system takes the same amount of time. In this diagram, time flows horizontally and the vertical axis represents which load is being worked on at the time. With the setup of the example done, let's first talk about the completely unintuitive way of doing laundry, serial execution. A system executed serially will run each task from start to finish with no part of the system running in parallel. So as you can see in the diagram, you do the washing, then the drying, then the folding for the first load and only after you're done with that do you even start doing the second load. If we assume that each stage in doing laundry task takes 30 minutes, then you would spend an entire six hours doing just four loads of laundry. But the thing is, I can't imagine that anyone actually does laundry serially. They intuitively execute different stages of the doing laundry process in parallel. Nothing is stopping you from washing the second load while the first load is drying. And this is exactly the idea behind pipelining. Let me remind you, the prerequisite for pipelining something is being able to execute the different stages in the process in parallel. So let's see how a pipeline execution of the system looks. As you can see, we overlap the independent stages in the doing laundry process. So at a time t1, we have the first load drying and the second load washing. At time t2, we have the first load getting folded, the second load drying, and the third load is washing. Then at time t3, the first load is completely done being processed and the next load will be done at time t4. Assuming again that each stage takes 30 minutes, it would only take three hours to do four loads of laundry instead of an entire six. Just a quick lesson on terminology. As you can see, at times t0 and t1, not every stage is being run. That is the startup period of the pipeline execution. Next, at times t2 and t3, every single stage is being run. This is the steady state period of the pipeline execution. Lastly, at times t4 and t5, again, we do not have every single stage running. This is the pipeline draining period. As you can see, the result of pipelining doing laundry is an increase in the throughput, or the amount of loads of laundry done per hour. A very simple observation can be made. Pipelining does not do anything to reduce latency or the time it takes to do one load of laundry from start to finish. However, to an external observer that does not know anything about the internals of the system and only cares about getting any clean load of laundry in their hands, will perceive the latency of just 30 minutes between each load of laundry being done. In other words, 
Pipelining can hide latency and increase throughput, but never reduce latency. This is an extremely useful result, as you can simply increase your throughput by just pipelining the execution of your system. With the lecture on the theory part of this video done, I just need to quickly point out that this is not a very accurate example now, is it? Usually, drying takes twice as long as washing. And who actually takes 30 minutes to fold a single load of laundry? It takes me an average of three days to get the laundry out of the dryer. So it obviously can't take just 30 minutes to fold the laundry. All right, on a more serious note, there are some hidden assumptions made in this example. First, the assumption of every stage in the process taking the same amount of time is actually too simple for real life systems. It is very often the case that some parts of the pipeline are unbalanced. How an unbalanced pipeline affects throughput and perceived latency is a known result and I might cover it in a future video. Please let me know in the comments below if you would like me to talk about these theoretic results in a future video. Next assumption is that there is no overhead from controlling the system. In the case of the laundry machine, it would take you a non-zero amount of time to move the laundry from the washer into the dryer and from the dryer onto the folding table and then from the folding table into the closet. But this is simply not accounted for in these theoretical models. The cost of controlling a pipeline can vary depending on if there is a single entity exercising central control on every single stage of the pipeline, or if it's a distributed system where each stage handles control for itself. So the main trade-off between central and distributed control is how much do you care about speed up versus the added complexity of the distributed control system. Last assumption here is that you cannot fit more than one load of laundry into the washer or the dryer. Therefore, there is an implied maximum system capacity of three loads of laundry being in flight at the same time. This is actually pretty realistic, as computer systems are typically constrained by the amount of memory they have. So, pipelining can also help increase the throughput of a system without using much more resources, which is kind of neat. Anyways, with the full theory review over, let's move right along to some more examples of pipelining. I will rather quickly go through three examples of where pipelining is used. The first example I want to talk about is a restaurant. When cooking food, there are a lot of tasks that do not really need your supervision and you can do other things at the same time. As an example, it can take a while to boil certain vegetables or it can take a long time to bake a pie. But while those things are happening, you can do whatever else it is that you may need to do, like cut vegetables, sear a steak, or plate up for the customer. This way, even if the kitchen has only one chef, many, many more customers can be fed faster by pipelining the cooking process. Next example is actually a current industry standard in data engineering. It is extremely common to see a three-stage pipeline as a primary system architecture for data processing systems. The three stages are typically data ingestion, data processing, and data persistence. The system design lends itself to massive increases in overall data processing throughput because the data ingestion stage can be running at the same time as a previously ingested data set is being processed, all at the same time as a yet another data set is being put into persistent storage in either a database, a data lake, or a data warehouse. In other words, I believe that pipelining is an integral part of the big data revolution. Last example I want to touch on is finally back within the world of computer architecture. You would typically learn about pipelining for the very first time in the context of computer architecture. And that's because modern CPUs are incredibly heavily reliant on pipelining to increase the throughput of the overall system. In a typical introductory class on computer architecture, you will see a simplistic CPU data path that has around five stages, instruction fetch, instruction decode, instruction execution, memory access, and lastly, instruction commit. As a heads up, your profs are lying through their teeth. The CPU pipelines have not been this simple almost ever. Just look at a modern CPU microarchitecture. The pipeline depth for the Zen 3 family of CPUs is 19 stages deep. Anyway, there is a quick honorable mention that I have to bring up. Literally the entire manufacturing industry. Almost all manufacturing processes out there are just having an object to be manufactured sitting on a conveyor belt being passed by assembly stages. At this point, you should be convinced that pipelining is in all sorts of places and is extremely important. Now, don't you wish you could play around with a pipeline to see how changing the number of stages, processing times, 
max pipeline capacities and maybe even unbalancing a pipeline could affect the throughput of an entire system? Guess what? I made a pipelining simulator just so that people can play with it and see how changing certain parameters can affect the overall results. In this part of the video, I will talk about how to use the simulator and explain how it works at a high level. The link to the GitHub repository is in the description. One current limitation of the simulator is that it only works on Linux because I needed pthread barriers to implement the pipelining and it's a CLI only application. All right, let's talk about the simulator that I made. First things first, the simulator takes a configuration file as a parameter that lets you specify a couple things. The number of stages in the pipeline, the number of work items to process, the maximum number of work items that can be in the system at the same time, the time to process each work item, and lastly, the factor by which you want to unbalance each stage in the pipeline, if you want to do that, obviously. There is also an extra configuration parameter that lets you skip the serial execution of the simulator in case you simply do not care to see the results of the serial execution, but this will disable some performance statistics from being shown to you, so I would suggest leaving it on. In case you do not want to provide any parameter, there are same defaults for each parameter that let you just run the simulator on its own. The simulator works by first running the system described in the configuration file serially, then pipelining the execution of the system by executing each individual stage in its own thread. The work item processing is simulated by simply having each thread sleep for a given amount of time in microseconds for each work item. The pipeline simulation is managed by a central controller that redirects stage outputs to stage inputs and controls the overall execution of the pipeline. This adds a bit of delay and noise to the output data, which I actually consider a feature. As I discussed before, the control overhead is assumed to be zero in most theoretical discussions, but control overhead is rarely actually zero. The delay incurred by central control creates much more realistic simulation results, which makes the results far more interesting in my opinion. Lastly, all the code for the simulator is well documented and is written in completely standard C++ with pthreads. In other words, if you can comprehend somewhat simple C++, you should be able to follow the simulator code. There's only one instance of C++ black magic that I decided to throw in for those that want to find out about a really horrible feature that C++ technically supports. I cannot tell you how fun and insightful it was to implement this tiny simulator and how challenging it was to get the controller right. But that is besides the point. Go ahead and play around with the simulator on your own. I'm sure that if you stayed all the way until this part of the video, then you will definitely find it fun to play with. Looking back on the video, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. I really hope that the theory review of pipelining proved useful to some of you and that you will find playing around with the simulator I created to be particularly fun. If you find any of this fun, insightful, interesting, or even useful, then please consider subscribing to my channel and maybe liking this video. That is all I had to say today. Thank you for your time. Bye.